Okay, now we're actually starting to talk about mathematics. Uh, in this first presentation, we're going to introduce the complex numbers, and the first question we're going to answer is uh, what the complex numbers actually are. That may sound rather strange, especially if you're already used to working with complex numbers and this imaginary unit i, but actually, uh, historically speaking, that is a very valid question because um, you can't really see the complex number i anywhere in nature. You can talk about constructing real numbers, even such as root 2, and certainly integers, as well as rational numbers, are something that come from our common experience. But that imaginary unit i actually had a lot of very good mathematicians stumped for a long time. And ultimately, the way the axiomatic method solves any kind of qualms about complex numbers that might exist is by simply constructing an entity that has the properties that we want the complex numbers to have. Because basically, if you can correctly construct something with certain properties, then it exists. So let's take a look at how this is done. Um, like I said, you've probably worked with complex numbers a plus ib before, and we've got this somewhat mysterious imaginary unit that is the sort of the square root of negative 1, right? Uh, but we will formally construct entities that work like this to make absolutely sure that something like that exists. The visualization, if you've seen those things before, will not change. So the construction mainly just alleviates any kinds of uh, formal fears that there might exist. Uh, we will assume that the real numbers work like they always did. So we're not going to explicitly talk about what the real numbers are. And so that means we don't have a fully formal introduction to the whole thing. But it can serve to facilitate, as I mentioned in the introduction, it can serve to facilitate the transition to doing proofs. Uh, for a full formal introduction to the numbers, number systems, if uh, you are local, if you're interested in Louisiana Tech, you could consider my class on Fundamentals of Mathematics, which is also online on my website. And if you really like that abstract stuff, well, a colleague once told me that I've got a certain disease, which is any time I teach a class, I have to write the book for it. And uh, certainly, this is the book for Fundamentals of Mathematics here on the left. And if you're interested in, al in analysis of functions of a real variable, well, that would be the text on the right. Uh, do not worry, I am not writing a complex analysis text, so you're going to stay with, with uh, other references for this class. All right, uh, well, enough of those commercials. Let's take a look at what the complex numbers are. The complex numbers are the set R2, which we know, of course, that's the xy plane, right? Uh, but it is equipped with something new. So we will equip it with addition and multiplication that are defined as follows. And so now we take two complex numbers, a, b, and c, d. Notice that because we define the complex numbers as the x, y plane, at this stage, complex numbers are pairs of real numbers, a, b, and uh, c, d. And we define the addition as the regular vector addition, actually. You just add the first components and you add the second components. And if you're accustomed to the elements in R2 to be vectors, then you know there is no decent multiplication for vectors out there. Well, in R2, there is an exception, namely the complex multiplication can be defined. And it's that AB times CD is AC minus BD uh, in the first component and AD plus BC in the second component. And you notice already, if you're used to complex numbers as real part plus I times imaginary part, then AC is just what you get when you multiply the real parts. BD or negative BD is what you get when you multiply IBD with I, uh, IB with ID. And AD plus BC, that's the imaginary part. That's what you get when you have A times IC, that A times ID, which would be IAD, and B times IC, which would be IBC. So this is set up to give us an entity that can be formally defined but which has the properties that we want the complex numbers to have. The zero in the complex numbers is the origin, where r indicates that really we're looking at the zero and the real numbers here. 
the 1 in the complex numbers is exactly where you would expect it to be, x equals 1, y equals 0. And the imaginary unit is also where you expect it to be, x is equal to 0 and y is equal to 1. We want to construct the complex numbers formally, but ultimately we do not want to deal with this formal mess all the time. We don't want to always try to remember I have to remember what the complex multiplication is and of course if we write complex numbers in the form a b being a times 1 plus b times i and that really works out right because a times 1 is a 0 b times i is 0 b and if you add that together you get a b well then we can write the complex numbers in the form a plus i b and we will see that this formulation of the complex numbers actually works just like we expect it to and I've, I've, I apologize I've talked all along as, as if you know complex numbers already. If you don't, well, a plus ib will work just like a polynomial with the additional property that i squared is negative 1, and that's really the whole secret to the technicalities of working, of working with complex numbers. Okay, so for z equals a plus ib being a complex number, the number a is called the real part, which is also denoted r of z, and the number b is also called the imaginary part, and that is denoted i of z. Uh, if we want to visualize complex numbers, and that's one of the uh, parts that makes complex analysis rather pretty, well, we have a real axis and we have an imaginary axis, which is nothing but the xy plane, except that now we call x the real part and, and y the imaginary part. And if we have a complex number, then that complex number is sometimes also interpreted as the vector that points towards the point, so as the position vector that you uh, may remember from calculus, and uh, then the number is z equals x plus i y, uh, x is the real part, and y is the imaginary part. Now the above notation is not mandatory, but it serves unnecessary adjustments if we try to consistently use it, and so typically a complex, numbers will always have, a complex number will have a real part x and an imaginary part y that is called x, those are, and which are called x and y. So be prepared for exceptions, but usually z will be equal to x plus i y. Uh, now let's look at a theorem that says that the complex numbers are a field. Well, okay, there's a theorem. The complex numbers with addition, multiplication, 0 and 1 as above are a field. But what does that mean? Well, a field is something, is a mathematical entity that has the following properties. Uh, addition is associative. Oh my goodness. When was the last time you've heard that? You may have heard it in high school at some point in time and uh, very quickly moved on because associativity just means that when you've got three complex numbers that you want to add you can first add z1 and z2 and then add z3 or you can first add z2 and z3 and then add z1. Now this is something that as as long as you've got enough practice with numbers you don't think about it very much and from an applied point of view you shouldn't but from a pure mathematical point of view, even though we know that this is a property of the real numbers, because now the complex numbers are this strange entity with that, uh, that strange way of looking at, at R2, if you will, with that multiplication attached to it, we would really have to formally prove that this follows from the construction, and it can be proved. Similarly, addition is commutative. What does that mean? Well, that means that it doesn't matter in which order you add complex numbers, something else that we're very much accustomed to from the real numbers. Uh, there is a neutral element for addition, which is 0, and that means that uh, z plus 0 equals z for all complex numbers z, something that's also very familiar. And finally, for every complex number, there's an additive inverse element, the negative of it, so there is some complex number, so that z plus that complex number is 0. These are all fairly easy to justify, and we will do that, um, but basically, the idea is because the complex numbers have been constructed, all these properties that we expect them to have actually formally would have to be justified. Uh, if we want to visualize complex addition, and we're not done with the field axioms, by the way, but just if we want to visualize complex addition, of course, we have our x-axis and our y-axis, which give us the real and imaginary parts. And then if we have a number z1 and a number z2, well, then... Let's superimpose a grid here and see that z1 is apparently 1 plus 2i and z2 is 3 plus i. 
And to add those two complex numbers, now we add the real part on here. So the real part of the result will be 4. And we add this imaginary part on here. So the imaginary part of the result should be 3. So this result should be 4 plus 3i. Let's hope I'm not embarrassing myself here. Yes, that is the result. And what we notice is that where this is z1 plus z2, this is exactly the addition of vectors. So that is one of the things, again, that makes complex numbers rather nice. Complex addition is essentially vector addition. And so we can translate vectors into complex, two-dimensional vectors into complex numbers if we wish to do so. Uh, so the preceding properties actually should all follow from the corresponding properties from the com for the components, and they do. Now, a field also has a multiplication, and so we also have that the multiplication is associative, which means it doesn't matter whether you first multiply z1 and z2 and then multiply that with z3, or whether you first multiply z2 and z3 and then multiply that with z1. But because of the rather complicated definition of the multiplication, we realize here that, yeah, that, that may be something that we have to double check, right? Um, Multiplication is also commutative, which means that it doesn't matter in which order you multiply complex numbers. And again, as obvious as that may feel for addition, for multiplication, because the definition involves a rather complicated formula, that is something that may actually take some time to, to verify. Uh, there is a neutral element 1 not equal 0 for multiplication, which means that um, there is an element so that 1 times z is equal to z for all complex numbers. For every non-zero complex numbers, we've got this multiplicative inverse. So we've got something so that z times z inverse equals 1. And multiplication is uh, distributive or left distributive over addition, which means that if you multiply z1 plus z2 from the left with z1, then that's z1 times z2 plus z1 times z3. That's the, the usual way in which we multiply out parentheses, but also notice that this uh, property number 9 is really the only one that connects multiplication and addition. Okay, now the proof can take a long time and uh, it is a good exercise. I'm not going to take a complete dive on you. We will prove some of the properties but not all of them. Some other properties are probably assigned as exercises if I remember the syllabus correctly. Okay, so throughout we will let z be x plus i y which is also the pair x y. We let z1 be x1, y1, and we let z2 be x2, y2. And so, for example, let's verify additive inverse as well. The additive inverse of z equals x plus i, y, which is x, y, what ought that to be? Well, it should be the negative of the number. So it should be negative z, but notice that negative z is a compound symbol, and we really define negative z as negative x plus negative y, i, which is negative x, negative y as a pair. And it is that because when we take z plus negative z, well, that's xy plus negative x negative y. That's x plus negative x comma y plus negative y. And that ends up being 0, 0, which is the complex number 0. So the usual formula for the additive inverse that we know, or that we would anticipate, at least, even if we haven't seen complex numbers before, what should the negative of a number b, well, you just stick the negative signs where they obviously ought to go, that this negative works the way it should be because it gives us an object with the right properties. And that is really a different way of looking at things than what we are used to. Um, it is, technically speaking, actually because everything has to be derived from x, and technically speaking, you could say it is the right way of looking at things, but at the same time, we will very quickly move on. And after we have verified that everything works as it should, we will just use it uh, the way the computations work more easily. So we will start working with complex numbers as x plus i, y, not as these pairs with certain kinds of properties. Okay, let's see what else we're proving. Let's prove the computativity of multiplication. I specifically left out the associativity because that one is rather nasty. Uh, if it's a homework problem, I apologize for assigning it, but it's good for me. <laughs> so let's take a look at commutativity of multiplication. z1 times z2, well, that would be x1, y1 times x2, y2. And now we just have to work out 
what that is and if you don't remember that formula it may be a good idea to now just open up the presentation itself stop the presentation and uh, look for the definition but what it is is well real parts minus product of the imaginary parts and then real part of the first imaginary part of the second plus imaginary part of the first real part of the second like this and if we're now looking at commutativity notice that Z2 has everything with subscripts 2, Z1 has everything with subscripts 1. Commutativity means we ought to be able to flip those. And because real multiplication is commutative, this is of course the same as x2, x1 minus y2, y1, x2, y1 plus y2, x1. Yeah, that's okay. I, you notice I'm stopping here because, okay, that's x2, y1 here and y2 x1 from here so I also used commutativity of addition but these two are the same and if you then take the time and patience to puzzle this apart or just verify it by multiplying x1 y x2 y2 x1 y1 out you realize that that's the same thing and so that means that z1 z2 really is z2 z1. Uh, the multiplicative inverse is, is also interesting because we of course need to show what the multiplicative inverse is and the multiplicative inverse z inverse so the inverse multiplicative inverse of x y is x over x squared plus y squared and negative y over x squared plus y squared and I want you to try that one out that is a really good exercise of course what you do is you just multiply this with x y and you verify that the result has to be one zero and so with that we're actually leaving this proof as an example, well, if we want to find the multiplicative inverse of 3 plus 5i, well, 3 plus 5i inverse would be, let's see, 3 squared is 9, 5 squared is 25, so the sum of that is uh, 34, right? And then we just have 3 in the numerator and negative 5 in the numerator. So this is 3 over 34 minus i times 5 over 34. And remember how I mentioned in the introduction that computation is good for the soul? Well, this is one of the spaces that really shows why that is the case. Because after all that abstract stuff, which uh, can be quite demanding, something like this tells us, hey, we can still do stuff. And of course, this is comparatively easy, partly because it is easy. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it feels kind of good to be able to do these kinds of things. Uh, let's go back to the more abstract stuff definition. Uh, we want to be able to subtract complex numbers from each other and the definition of subtraction actually is the addition of the additive inverse and we also want to have fractions and the definition of a quotient is just that you multiply with the multiplicative inverse of the denominator. That being the case we can simplify the quotient 2 minus 3i over 5 plus 4i and at this stage we haven't really worked with quotients, we haven't talked about expanding a quotient and things like that, and so we really have to use the properties. 2 minus 3i over 5 plus 4i is 2 minus 3i, 5 plus 4i multiplicative inverse, and now we write out the multiplicative inverse, so we've got the 2 minus 3i, let's see, 5 squared is 25, 4 squared is 16, add that up, you get the denominator 41, and then your numerator is 5 in the real part and negative 4 in the imaginary part, so that really is the multiplicative inverse. Now we multiply this stuff out. Well, 2 times 5 over 41 is 10 over 41. Uh, 3 times 4 is 12, so we get 12 over 41. Negative, negative is positive, and i squared gives us the negative sign back. And then we have the imaginary part, and that's where we've got 2 times negative 4 over 41 is negative 8 over 41. Negative 3 times 5 over 41 is negative 15 over 41 and then if we simplify that we get negative 2 over 41 minus 23 over 41 i and so that is what that quotient is and of course the advantage of the simplified form is you've got one real part one imaginary part and no longer this complicated expression okay so uh, an important theorem therefore is that i squared is negative 1 and that can actually be proved i squared, remember i is 0 plus 1i, and if you multiply that out, you get 0 times 0 minus 1 times 1 from the uh, formula, because this could have fit, been written down as, as pairs, right, 0, 1, 0, 1, and then you get plus 0 times 1 
plus 1 times 0 times i. And what that gives you is negative 1. And so that is the proof already. So sometimes proofs can also be fairly quick. Uh, important proposition, if we've got a complex number, then 0 times the complex number or the complex number times 0 is equal to 0. Well, that's something that we know. Anything times 0 is 0, but we know that for real numbers we don't know that necessarily for complex numbers. So we're going to give two proofs here. Uh, on one hand, z times 0, if we look at that, that's xy times 0, 0. And if we work that out, that's x times 0 minus y times 0 plus y times 0 plus x times 0. Well, anything multiplied by 0, that's 0, 0. And that's 0, and that's the end of that proof. Um, and that uses the definition of the complex numbers as we introduce them, them here. So this is something that works exactly for these complex numbers. Proof 2. Well, if you can prove something twice, that doesn't make it any more true than if you can prove it once. One proof is good enough. But we're going to see this abstract point of view actually helping us in a little bit. And so let's look at a more abstract proof. Remember that 0 times z plus 0 times z. Well, that is 0 plus 0 times z because we can factor out the z. And 0 plus 0 is 0. So this is just 0 times z. And so that means that 0 is equal to 0 times z plus the multiplicative in additive inverse of 0 times z. But 0 times z is 0 times z plus 0 times z, and then we add another negative 0 times z to keep that here. And now we can use associativity, so we bump these parentheses over, so this is 0 times z plus 0 times z plus negative 0 times z. And we realize this is the additive inverse of this one, so we get 0 z plus 0, and anything plus 0 is just that anything, so that's 0 times z. And that's z times 0 because multiplication is commutative, so we've got the abstract proof. Now this proof looks and feels a lot harder than the other one because this one is essentially computation, which, remember, is good for the soul. We're going to see in just a minute that this approach actually works nicer at certain stages. Um, this second proof is usually applied in more abstract settings. This works for abstract fields, for example. So although it is longer, it actually, as you go into more abstract mathematics, that proof actually is preferred. Um, now, if you don't want to go into more abstract mathematics, then you will ultimately keep working with these kinds of proofs, and, and that is just fine. Uh, the idea, however, for the abstract setting is, uh, ask yourself, do you rather want want to prove something times 0 is 0 in a bunch of abstract structures having to replicate arguments like these over and over again, or would you rather prove it once that it follows from the properties of a field or from certain properties of the field and then know that it's true anytime you've got these properties? Well, and the answer to me actually is I'd rather do it once and then realize it works whenever I've got the right kinds of properties, but it takes a while to uh, get there. Okay, further properties, take two complex numbers, then if z1 times z2 is equal to 0, then z1 is equal to 0, or z2 is equal to 0. That is something that you also know from real numbers that's behind all that factoring of quadratics that you do. The reason why we're interest, interested in factoring is that we're usually interested in solving equations. Something equals 0. And if we then can factor that something on the left side, well, then we know that either one of those two factors, maybe even both, must be equal to 0. First proof, well, take two complex numbers whose product is 0. And suppose without loss of generality that z1 is not equal to 0, because if z1 is equal to 0, we're done. Uh, then z1 has a multiplicative inverse. We know that. That's one of the things we've got from the axioms. And so then we obtain, in case that z1 is not equal to 0, we obtain that z2 is 1 times z2. Well, big deal. But the 1 is z1 inverse z1 times z2. And I've already left out parentheses here because associativity can be taken for granted. And z1 times z2 was equal to, to 0. That's what we have here. So this is z1 inverse times 0, which is equal to 0. And that's the end of the proof because we either have z1 equals 0 or z1 is not equal to 0, but if z1 is not equal to 0, then we know that z2 is equal to 0.
Notice that this proof also is very similar to some things that you may have seen in calculus. Uh, a teaching assistant who taught me a long time ago said, well, there are two tricks in mathematics. One is multiplying by one and the other one is adding zero. You've seen the adding zero on the previous panel and here's the multiplying by one. So even though this is in a more abstract setting, this is still very similar to things that you've done when you were doing certain kinds of computations in calculus. Now let's take a look at uh, proof number two using pairs and uh, well actually forget it. Uh, sorry about that but that feels very very messy to me and so I'd rather not do that proof. If you want to do that proof or if you want to do that proof to yourself uh, go ahead and do it. It probably is a really good exercise and maybe it isn't as hard as I make it seem here, but after you've worked with this abstract stuff for a while, as I mentioned to you, you actually start preferring it because these computations can and do take quite long. And I, I very much doubt that it would be just a three-line proof to do this using the pairs. Just take x1, y1, x2, y2, multiply them out, set that equal to zero. That gives you a system of two equations for two variables. Uh, for two equations for four variables and so then you somehow have to use that if z1 is not equal to zero then z2 must be equal to zero. That looks like a really lengthy computation and in fact because you have to assume z1 is not equal to zero it actually feels very much like this proof. Okay so what I'm trying to drive home here is that sometimes the abstra abstract stuff actually works better than the concrete stuff and that's really why this abstract mathematics has become so ingrained uh, within mathematics. This is something that only started in the second half of the 19th century, so post-1850, when people realized that this stuff is very, very powerful. And what it also then verifies, and hopefully for you too, is that, okay, guys, uh, mathematicians who do this abstract stuff aren't nuts. We're doing this because this stuff is just very, very efficient. It's just because it's so removed from everyday experience, it, it feels rather alien at first. Okay, the thing then is, of course, choosing the right approach can almost be an art form. Sometimes I also sit down and try to do an abstract proof when, in fact, a direct computation would be a whole lot easier. And that just comes with experience. That's why uh, learning how to do proofs is hard. Okay. Let's take a look at the absolute value of a complex number. For a complex number a plus ib, we define the absolute value to be the square root of a squared plus b squared. So it's just the magnitude of that vector. We'll call that the absolute value or the modulus, as it's also called. And modulus really is something that is just used for complex numbers, as far as I know. I have rarely talked about the modulus of a vector. Um, in fact, I don't recall ever talking about the modulus of a vector. So that is probably something that is just complex variables parlance. And uh, then we've got a theorem that tells us the properties of the absolute value. Well, for all complex numbers, we have that the absolute value is greater or equal than zero. And sometimes people can be a bit preachy about using inequalities because in fact, again, with all this abstract stuff, it can be proved that there is no sensible way to order the uh, complex numbers in such a way that the order also interfaces as nicely with the field properties as it does for, say, the real numbers, for example. But because the absolute value is a real number, it is permissible to use inequalities here. And that uh, that's the element symbol. I've tried to avoid that in most of the presentations, but here apparently it slipped in. But because the absolute value is a real number, it is permissible to work with inequalities there. Uh, for all complex numbers, we have that the modulus is equal to zero if and only if the number is equal to zero. We have that for any two complex numbers, the absolute value of the product is the product of the absolute values. And we have something called the triangular inequality, which will be used a great deal in what we're doing. And that triangular inequality says that for any two complex numbers, we have that the absolute value of the sum is less than or equal than the sum of the absolute values. This is also something that you may have seen with vectors before. Uh, if you don't remember it, it's most likely because you haven't used it very much. That is something 
that is not abnormal at all and shouldn't worry you too much, but we will use the triangular inequality quite a bit in this class and so we will be remembering it at some point in time to the point where you just can't help but remember it. In terms of proving it, well, parts one, parts 0 through 2 are really good exercises and I recommend them to you. The last part is actually rather nasty and so let's take a look at the proof and let's also think a little bit about how, especially at the beginning, you can read proofs. Throughout this proof you will wonder why is he doing that? Where is that leading to? And the thing is a proof is supposed to be presented in a linear fashion and in that linear fashion the most important thing is to realize that every step follows from the preceding step to make sure that everything is correct. Once we've done that we can go back and look at the proof and often should look at the proof and try to figure out well where did all those stuff come, this stuff come from? But the first reading of a proof, um, some colleagues of mine might disagree with that, but upon first reading of any proof, even when I'm trying to figure out what the idea behind it is, uh, the first time I read a proof, I just try to verify that it is correct. So let's see if we can at least do that. So for part three, which was this triangular inequality, we take two complex numbers, a plus ib and c plus id, I didn't want to go with x1, y1 and x2, y2 because tracking subscripts is rather nasty and here we know a and b are connected to the first number, c and d are connected to the second number. Okay, then, well, 0 is smaller or equal than any square of real numbers and so certainly 0 is less than or equal than ad minus bc quantity squared. Never mind why we're doing that, we just know that is true. And if we multiply that out, we get a squared d squared minus 2abcd, just sort that out, uh, plus b squared c squared, so that's correct. And so that means if we bring the 2abcd over, we get that 2abcd is smaller or equal than a squared d squared plus b squared c squared. Sure, that's right. Now if I want to, I can add a squared c squared plus b squared d squared on both sides and I get a valid inequality, right? This is the same inequality as the previous line, only that I've added a squared c squared and b squared d squared on both sides. Again, well, why are we doing that? Let's delay that a little bit right now. We just realized, yes, that's right. It's correct. Okay, now if we realize that this is a completed square, and that's where sometimes it's also helpful just to just read proofs in, in the opposite direction, ac plus bd quantity squared, that's what we have up here, just multiply it out. And that's less than or equal than a squared plus b squared c squared plus d squared because that's this right side factored. And again, the best way to, just, to justify that step is to realize that this is a squared times c squared plus b squared times d squared plus, uh, plus a squared d squared plus b squared c squared here. Yeah, it's just first, outer, inner, last. Um, but here we can maybe take a quick stop and realize, well, this is the square of the absolute value of z1, and this is the square of the absolute value of z2. So we're, we're getting closer to dealing with z1 and z2 on the right side. It's just that here we have a multiplication. Okay, so what are we doing next? Well, we take square roots and multiply by 2. So taking square roots on the right side, that's obvious. Taking the square root on the left side is the AC plus BD and then I multiply both sides by 2 so again this is something that we are allowed to do never mind why we're doing it it's allowed so up to here again we have something that is correct and now we again add stuff to that we add a squared plus c squared plus b squared plus d squared on the left side as well as on the right side a squared plus c squared plus b squared plus d squared that's all that happened and again we have complete squares or perfect squares. So on the left side we get a plus c squared, that's this stuff up front, that's quite visible if you work with the uh, binomial formulas for a while, but you have. Similarly b, b plus d quantity squared is here, and here we have square root of a squared plus b squared plus square root of c squared plus d squared, because if you multiply that out you get the square of this, which is a squared plus b squared, 2 times the first times the second, which is the middle term, and then the last one squared, which is the last term here. So that works out. But now, this is z1 plus z2 absolute value squared, because z1 plus z2 is a plus c plus i times b plus d, 
and so you get a plus c squared plus b plus d squared as the uh, absolute value and on the right side we just get z1 absolute value plus z2 absolute value squared and then of course if you take square roots you get that z1 plus z2 is less than or equal than z1 absolute value plus z2 absolute value and that's the whole thing now that feels like magic because how on earth can you anticipate this from here? And uh, the honest to goodness answer is uh, I can't. The way I've set up this proof is that I started down here, squared, figured out that this is what the square is, multiplied things out, realized I could cancel, uh, canceled the twos, squared again, multiplied things out again, canceled and ultimately brought it over to, to one side and realized, aha, that last step is true. The reason why I cannot present it that way is because it's the logically wrong direction, because in this simplification we start out with the um, apps, with, with the triangular inequality and then, then just simplify it down. Now in most computations all steps reverse, but whenever you take square roots that's kind of problematic because you get plus minus sometimes and things like that and so then it is just safer in the presentation also for my own sake to make absolutely sure that this is right to start with what I know is true and then go aha this implies this implies this implies this and so on all the way until I have verified that this is the um, the triangular inequality We'll see this a couple of times as we're working with limits also and as we're doing proofs. Like I said, this is something that requires some getting used to and so do not get discouraged if the proofs on the homework take a bit longer, take a good bit longer, take maybe even a lot longer than the other stuff that you're doing that is entirely normal, but exactly this thinking about it for a long time, even if ultimately the proof is rather quick, exactly that is the training that ultimately makes these proofs come more easily. And when I say more easily, I, I really don't mean easy. Uh, it's just easier than it was before after a while. Okay, finally we want to talk about the complex conjugate. And for a complex number z equals x plus iy, the complex conjugate is denoted z bar and it's just x minus iy. So visually speaking, we take our real axis, we take our imaginary axis, we've got a complex number z equals x plus iy, which I visualize here as a vector. And what happens then is we look at the imaginary part, we look at the real part. The imaginary part is being replaced by its negative, which means that we're flipping across the real axis and then z bar equals x minus iy is exactly down here. That's what the complex conjugate is. Now that feels a lot better than all these uh, proofs because here we've, we've got something that is nice and visual and one of the attractive things about complex analysis that is complex analysis is that we can go back and forth between proofs and visualizations rather fluently. Okay, so then our final proposition maybe even is that when you've got two complex numbers z1 and z2 we have, oh yeah, not, not the final proposition, we have that the conjugate of the sum is the sum of the conjugate, the conjugate of the product is the product of the conjugates, conjugate of the difference is the difference of the conjugates, and the conjugate of the quotient is the quotient of the conjugates, where of course you have to be really careful which bar is the conjugate and which bar is actually the sign that this is the quotient, but I think you can sort that out here, otherwise my recommendation always is make the fraction line longer than all the other lines. And again, we're not going to prove everything, we'll only show part two. Uh, in fact, one and two are fairly easy and four is uh, probably harder, um, but that would be a good exercise and two is right in the middle. It's fairly complicated. Let's take a look at it. Z1 times Z2 complex conjugate. That would be, and now we just use standard notation, remember Z1 was always X1, Y1 and Z2 was always X2, Y2, so that doesn't change. Then we multiply that out product of the real parts minus product of the imaginary parts and then real part times imaginary part plus imaginary part times real part and you still have the bar on top but the bar 
Well, the bar just leaves the real part alone and replaces the imaginary part with its negative. And now we just have to puzzle that out somehow, and I don't recall right now how. Right, because now in this product here, the imaginary parts all have negative signs, so we want to somehow parlay negative signs into the y's. And we can do that because, well, here the x1, x2 stays the same. y1, y2 is the same as negative y1, negative y2, so that's okay. Then this negative sign is just pushed into the negative y2, and this negative sign is pushed into the negative y1, and this is all stuff that we know we can do from the real numbers, so this is equal. And now, if you just multiply that out, you realize this is the product of x1, negative y1, x2, negative y2, and that is x1, y1 conjugate times x2, y2 conjugate, which is z1 conjugate times z2 conjugate. So again, something that if we just pay close enough attention to how things are defined, we can verify that with a fairly abstract computation. And so we're somewhere between computation and abstract stuff. Again, you may not be used to this stuff, but if you do this more frequently, you will get used to it. And uh, the final proposition now is that for all complex numbers we have that complex number plus its conjugate is twice the real part. Well, sure, because when the imaginary parts, here you've got it positive, here you've got it negative, that real, the imaginary parts go away, and then the real parts just add up. And the square is z times z bar, excuse me, the phone is ringing. Okay, we're back. Well, I had actually several phone calls, but that's been taken care of. So now let's take a look at this again. Uh, the square of the absolute value of a complex number is the complex number times its conjugate. And uh, finally, for any non-zero complex number, the multiplicative inverse is 1 over z, as it's also written, which is the complex conjugate over z absolute value squared, which is actually something that you can basically anticipate from the formula that we had derived on, on an earlier panel. And so again, opening up the presentation and going back to that panel uh, can help a great deal if you open up the slides. But for now, these actually are not that bad to verify. And so this is a good exercise. And so with that, uh, we are done with our first presentation. Took a long time as the phone rang, I actually realized I'm getting a little hungry, so I'm going to have my second breakfast, and you, well, either have second breakfast too, or lunch, or dinner, or do some homework. I'll see you in the next one.